Shipshape.pro, the number one resource in the U.S. for marine professionals. Professional. Hey everybody, welcome to the Shipshape Podcast. This is Talha Bhatti and with me is Meryl Ferret. And today we have a very special guest with us. His name is Robert Poulet. Sounds French. He is at some level. We'll ask him about uh, that. But I know him because he is a liveaboard at my marina. And he's got a very interesting past. Um, how he got here, we're going to find that out. What his uh, passion for sailboating is going to drive him to. We're going to ask him about that. And uh, welcome to the show, Robert. Hello, how are you doing? So, Rob, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I got into the sailing community, I would say, at a very early age. My dad always had sailboats growing up, and it was something that I enjoyed doing, you know. So did you know how to sail? Did he teach you how to sail? He did teach me how to sail. And we would go up and down the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, we would be in storms and stuff like that. And that's really when you learn how to sail the boat, to be honest. So yeah, I learned a lot from that, and it definitely gave me the drive to want to do it some more in my later life. What size mm-hmm. boat were you on? Uh, we were on a 30 and 36 foot. Uh, two 30 foot boats and a, and a 36 foot boat. And all three sailboats. They were all Catalinas. All Catalinas. There was a Mark 1 Catalina and then a Mark 2 and then he had the, uh, 36 Mark 3. And you live on a Catalina? Yeah, was, right? did I live on it? Do you no, live, live on, on, a, on a Catalina? No, I live on a Morgan. A Morgan. And how, how many years then have you been doing this whole liveaboard thing? And how big a gap, like, between when you did it with your dad was there to when you came back? Well, I would say around 2005, I stopped sailing with him. And then I was in the Navy for six years. And then another 10 years after that, after I got out before I even purchased the boat. So it was a good 15 years at least between okay. the gap. And then how, and we'll definitely dig, uh, dig deeper in the, into the whole Navy experience because you're still on the water. But how long have you been doing the whole Liverpool thing yeah. since then? How have I enjoyed it? I would say, oh. How long have you been doing the whole liveaboard thing? About three and a half years now. Nice. And all on and, the uh, same board? Or did you upgrade? No, boats not on the same boat. No, no. On two separate boats. Um, I had an S2, and that was a great boat. But then I thought the Morgan was a better liveaboard boat, and I bought that. So that was hmm. the best way to make that happen. Is there anything thing you look for in a liveaboard boat, you know? Isn't the S2 like a racing sailboat or something? Well, this was the 9.2A, the ass cockpit, and it was, uh, it was pretty spacious. It was supposed to be in competition with the Catalina 30, which is, you know, a family boat. And, um, yeah, it was a great boat. It was a great boat. It just, uh, had more trouble with it than I wanted to deal with. So tell us so about. You have to find a good balance. Yeah. You have to find a good balance. So tell us about, like, d- describe a day in the life of a liveaboard. Yeah, what what does that look like for you? Oh, it's, well, it's just like anybody else's day. You just wake up and do what you have to do. But in between that, just like your house, if you live in a house, then, you know, it's, it's the same thing. You look out for stuff that needs to be taken care of and so forth and so on, and you just do it. Other than that, it's the same thing. The fact that your house moves it's, doesn't make it like a different world. No. I mean, I think, of course, it's not for everybody, but I, I would say that it's something that you can acquire over time if you're not used to it the fact that your house moves but it's a mindset it's a lifestyle and mm-hmm. um, sure. but other than that it's uh it's pretty much the same i would say and so why is it not for everybody well there can be physical handicaps you know like you may not enjoy climbing up and down get in your boat um because mm-hmm. usually that's always the case and stuff like that but at that point you would you know you would probably not enjoy climbing up the stairs in your house anyway, but it's just it's just something you uh, either want to do or you don't want to do. I mm. think that's the case for most people. If you want to and, do it, and, you'll do it. If you don't, then you, you won't. And so you enjoy it, is what you're saying, to the point where yeah. you... But like enough to recommend it to others? Oh, yeah. My only regret is I don't have a bigger boat. <laughs> Right? And that's just a matter of time, perhaps. And right? So many people just upgrade once they know they're committed to it. Right, right. You just work your way up, just like a house. So then, so what, what is it that, like, keeps you the most engaged in it? Was it the community? Was it just like waking up on the ocean every day? Like, what is your favorite part, your 
favorite three things about living on a boat? Oh boy. Do you like living on a boat? I do like living on a boat. Everything's great about it. Waking up on the water, everything you said, but then there's more to it, you know, there's more to it. I, I enjoy the water in a different way. I enjoy like maritime history, all that good stuff. And it just falls right in line with my background. I've been in the Navy. I've been around naval ships. To wake up on a boat is just natural for me, to be honest. I work on boats. I wake up on boats. I, yeah, I've always been on the sea since I was young. So mm. it's just natural. Yeah. So before we dig deeper into like what your naval experience was, we asked this question from everybody is, and you know, you've probably seen them, but are you afraid of sharks? No, I'm not afraid of sharks. <laughs> no. <laughs> sharks, uh, usually don't uh, mess with humans. But I have really? heard lately off the coast of Spain that uh, these humpback whales have been attacking yachts traveling through there. And that's interesting. Maybe mm. uh, they don't Somebody like the sonar or something. Yeah, the sonar might be messing with them. Interesting. They but ran so, the rudders and the, yeah. To tell us a little bit about your Navy experience and like what, and that, that was a, a completely different animal then, right? Like you were in a much, much bigger boat. Yeah. You were, you were going, you know, you were crossing oceans perhaps overnight. Yeah. What, what yeah. was the life like there? Well, I was on a uh, Nimitz class aircraft carrier. I did two deployments on one of those and I did one on the Enterprise, the only of its class. And, and, um, and just so people have an idea, like what size of ship are we talking about? It's the largest warship ever built. For over 100,000 tons, if you compare that to the Titanic, the Titanic was about 45,000 tons, like full load. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And how long? 1,092 feet. Wow. And so you and, uh, were living aboard this vessel. How, how long at a time were you living aboard this vessel? Years at a time, in some cases. Wow. Yeah. What's the coolest but thing you I, but I, I was just asking, what's the coolest thing that you saw while you were out there on this giant ship? You can go places no other ship can, basically. The coolest thing I saw was um, the world. The world. I mean, that thing, that. like, it's yeah. like just a passport to wherever you want to go on nuclear power. The thing would just, you would leave the Suez Canal and you would be in Turkey at sunrise. You would leave mm. the Suez at sunset. Wow. It would, it would do... 800 miles in 24 hours. It was nothing for it. That's and that crazy. was just, you know, and that was in storms and stuff like that. Big seas, like 30, 40, 50 foot. Wait. But, uh, <laughs> I've seen the, the videos of the aircraft carriers where it's going so fast that the bow just like lifts up in the water like a fast power boat. How many, uh, what yeah. was the, the speed of the thing? You know, I don't think that anything on that ship reads correctly. All the gauges are off. <laughs> So were you going much faster than they said or much slower than they said? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we were... I Which think one, though? The, faster? Uh, faster, yeah. Oh, boy. Wow. Yeah. So you, you've obviously you've seen so much of the world already and a lot of it aboard, you know, an ocean-going vessel. What What is your dream adventure then? My dream adventure would be to do the uh, Mediterranean and then to work my way into the Persian Gulf, like somewhere around Dubai. That would be that would be ideal, but you would need a large ship. To, you would need a large vessel to do that, and mm. then cross the Atlantic. Mm. And you got to cross um, the Atlantic first. This this boat I'm on now can do it. I've I've read like stuff about owners taking theirs to five different continents and stuff like that. But you know, I mean, that requires requires a, a pretty good sized crew, and you know, you need a lot of automation mm. to do mm. stuff mm. like that. So, okay, so we're, we're going to bug you for a lot of tips sort of throughout, but say say somebody had a dream like yours, what sort of one tip that you'd give them to sort of nudge them in the right direction? Do it. Do it. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. so a lot of this is making sense about how, uh, you know, you're like, oh, being in a house is no different than a boat. Well, mm -hmm. now I understand that it's because you've never been in a house. You've only been on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I... um. I didn't grow up on a boat, that's for sure. Mm. But I grew up, uh, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, to be honest. Mm. And, um, I lived in houses all through my time, uh, in the Navy, you know, renting houses. And then, of course, after the Navy, and, uh, I owned a house. And, you know, I just found that it just wasn't as satisfying, nor did you own the house. Mm. You don't own the house. You don't ever really own the house. As soon as you own the house, you, you're either too old to enjoy it or you are, uh, you sold it already mm. and just carry the, the lump sum over somewhere else. 
So that's it, you know. So what brought you back into boating then, or living on it? I've always wanted to do it, and it was a perfect time in my life to do it. I'd just gotten out of a, a long relationship. I was married for quite a few years, and then uh, I just found like it was the, the good time to do it. So uh, how exactly did you go about finding your boat? Did you go on Yacht World, find it on Craigslist? Uh, you know, what'd you do? Well, this boat, um, this boat was found while living on my other boat. Uh, it was just brought from Florida, and the man who owned it, he did not want to make the six-hour round trip from Raleigh, North Carolina. It was a wonderful boat. He just couldn't deal with it. He didn't have the time. And um, he gave it to me for a good deal. He really did. Uh, it's hold number 22, an early boat. It's uh, been Coast Guard registered his whole life, and it's just been good. I, I have no complaints about it. And so how did you find the first one? How did you find the S2? Oh, the S2 was found on, I believe it was Craigslist. I have to be honest. I think it was Craigslist. And was it already in the water? And I, I don't found it. It was in the water, yes. Hmm. And it really, it it was a fixer upper. Um, the diesel needed work. It's not something I recommend. I recommend just going straight for the the one you want instead hmm. of wasting your time with a fixer upper. Okay. So, you know? so tell us more about then in this first situation that you had, like with the S2. What what sort of problems did you run up against? One was, like you said, the diesel. What other stuff should people look out for? The diesel, the condition of uh, all your rigging, the, uh, frankly, the condition of the uh, fiberglass, you know, like how soft the deck is, all the running gear associated with uh, steering, all your basic systems for your head and plumbing. Plumbing's a big one for sure. Don't want to deal with that if you don't have to. Um, but yeah, I mean, the general condition of the boat needs to be gone through. You know, is it safe? What kind of systems are installed? How recent are they? And, and you're a pretty handy guy, so I bet you ended up doing a lot of projects. But we're going to jump into those in just a sec. Let's let's first sort of backtrack a little. So you got this first boat, and you said this was sort of at the uh, after a long relationship. How did life change once you were on the boat? Like, yeah, you know, like were you always a minimalist, or yeah, you know, did you have to embrace that once you got on the boat? Yeah, you know, relationships. Oh, absolutely. Like, have those changed absolutely. since then. Yeah, I, uh, it was definitely a lifestyle change. And, you know, the weather is not always perfect, uh, as it isn't right now, but you just learn and it becomes second nature. And you become better for it, to be honest. You become more in tune with nature and so forth. Yeah, there's a lot that changes about you, but it either makes you or breaks you, I would say. What are, what are some of the things to look out for in terms of lifestyle changes? No. Or, or you can even give us a story. And before I would have done this, now I do this. Whatever. You learn to live beforehand. I would say you you really lived like excessively, you know, um, and you really don't have any aim on where you're spending your money and this and that. And when you're living on a boat, you you kind of buy things that you know will fit and make you happy within that world. And mm-hmm. so you just do that. And um, in the end, it's better. You have you know you're not just throwing money here and there and so forth mm. you know you're buying what you need look at that and things for the boat that will make you happier that will improve its performance especially if you're into it uh you know sailing it or so forth how old are you rob i am 35 how's the whole uh you know girl scenario going you got the boat oh boy <laughs> you might want to edit this one out <laughs> no i mean you can tell us as much or as little as you like well, I'll tell you what, as soon as the women find out you have a boat, that's it. That's it. Game over. <laughs> Too that's bad. It, yeah. <laughs> that's all it takes. So, so tell us, Rob, I mean, you obviously like sailing. What's your, the best sailing adventure you've had so far? And I bet you've done a lot of sales. It might be like a top three, even if you want. I would say a sail that I did with you up to uh, Cape Charles, or uh, not Cape Charles, Colonial Beach was a pretty good one, Tala. Yeah, so Rob and I... That boat went, was not, that boat was yeah. not rigged to go... Tell, tell them a little story, what? Rob. Tell them what happened, like, prior to where we left, just to give people a taste. We were we were actually out of our comfort zone. We were delivering a boat for Rob's friend, and uh, this is the story of that. Yeah, so we uh, picked this boat up. It was a Pearson 34, 1974, something like that. And it, uh, we had picked it up from Hampton, Virginia, and we were taking it to Little Creek, Virginia. And mm, that was the, test uh, run. the boat was in poor shape. It was, a, it was a test run, and it was also... So we could bring it back and, and work on things if we needed to. We didn't think that it would have any problem making the, 
the seven mile trip between the two places. Yeah, it was supposed to be well, two hours. That, <laughs> yeah, roughly. And uh, we only had a head sail, and we had a diesel. The the engine was not pushing. It it was uh, it was turning, but it wasn't pushing. And we ended up losing steering in thirty plus knots of wind. Um, mm-hmm. They had not installed a keyway in the steering, so the, yeah, basically so the, the steering wheel. Working. We had it on auto. The steering wheel wasn't working. The autopilot. We had it on autopilot. Yeah. Nothing was working. The autopilot the failed almost because the steering stop failed. Working, right? And we were trying to point up into the wind, and the boat just was too full of growth, and we we ended up having to be towed in, unfortunately. Yeah, we just kept losing ground, literally. And so then the next day we fixed everything up, you know, put in new lines. Rob's a genius with the engine, so he dug into that, changed this, changed that, put a shortcut for this, upgraded a couple of things, and... Mm-hmm. Then we were like, okay, now we can do a longer sail on this boat. And then we ended up sailing from Little Creek to Colonial Beach, and that was a 24-hour sail, and we we made really good headway. About 120 miles. Yeah, 24 hours, 120 miles, and uh, we got this little storm in the middle. Which is a head sail. Yeah, and uh, and we did. Miles. We were doing eight and a half to nine and a half average. Well, I'm pretty day. sure the the gauges must have been wrong on that too. It was fast. It was like. Not we based were, on not based on the time we covered time yeah. over distance. Yeah, because like, like really up. Yeah, and he'd be like, "How fast are you going? What are you doing?" Because like I'd have the boat like you know, <laughs> fully keeled over, just like riding the wind, like we we're in a race. Yeah, At I was in the V berth. Yeah, I was in the V berth, which is not the right place to sleep underway. I guess mm. running downwind it was it was acceptable, but um, mm. yeah, I was holding on for dear life and. Mm. uh the next morning, he, he crashed. Tyler crashed really hard. I just saw him go down and go face <laughs> down into the... He didn't even raise. He just was face down. Yeah. And um, at that point, the current was... The wind was still crazy, and uh, I had to turn it up into the Potomac River, which I think had an outgoing tide. So it was everything against us, and somehow we just got up in there. But later on, it cleared up. It was a beautiful day, and uh, we ended up grilling on the back of the boat sailing up the river at five and a half knots past all these fishing boats. It was a good mm-hmm. time. It was a good time. And I think one we of got the paid well for it. Yeah, and we got paid for it, right? And one of the lessons I learned then on a boat like that size, the best place to sleep on a sailboat is like right bang in the On middle. the low side. Yeah, on the low side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you still have to be careful because then if somebody tacks or jibes accidentally, you could totally fly off the couch. Like, we've seen that happen to a couple of friends of ours, unfortunately. Yeah, they have little nets you can install if yep. you feel on your boat. Yep. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. But that's one of them. And then, of course, I grew up sailing uh, with my dad, and we used to do trips from uh, Norfolk down to Norfolk, or from Baltimore down to Norfolk. And uh, mm. that was uh, that was always a great time. Mm. And how long a trip really was that be? Oh, it'd be about three or four days because we would stop every night. We would we would take our time and sightsee and just anchor out and anchor out exactly. And in, in, in like Rock Hall, Maryland, we would go to yeah, we would go up into Annapolis, stop on the mm-hmm. Potomac, anchor there. Yeah, sounds really. I mean, the way you just said it, it sounds like it. Yeah, you know, out of like an old photo album, like we're flipping pages or something. I don't know if people do that mm-hmm. anymore. <laughs> yeah, this was in the nineties, uh, early two thousands. Right. Wow. So uh, it. it was like the golden age of sailing back then, I think, on the bay, really. So um, either the boat that you have now or, you know, the previous boat, what's been the most expensive uh, repair that you've had to do? Uh, engine work. Mm-hmm. Engine work. But that's only because I haven't dived into other things yet. <laughs> um, I'm sure that hauling it out and doing some top side and bottom paint will definitely add to that. Mm. What type of engine work are you talking about? Um, I had to do the entire exhaust system and uh, the riser, the exhaust manifold, get a new riser and stuff like that. But relatively speaking, we're talking under a thousand dollars. Like it's nothing. Again, that would be like something you'd spend on your house. You know, and that, I mean, you'd that spend that most... just to make a cobblestone walkway that probably didn't look very good to begin with. <laughs> and the engine you know? is the most important part of the boat that way. You know? and, yeah. And oh it, yeah. But you are pretty handy with projects. So tell us, tell us some of the projects you, you've gotten into. Well, we have done, we worked on this, uh, main cat T47. It was like one of seven built and we did, um, we did a lot of engine work on that. They were Volvo Penta, uh, D3 diesels. 
pretty advanced engines. They're all electronic, turbocharged, five cylinder. We did all the maintenance on that. And then um, we did the bottom paint and uh, the light. Mm, but this uh, is. But Tala, for... you, were, you were part of all this. Yeah, this was for your marine company. So we're definitely going to. Yeah. We're going to do a whole episode on that, on Rob's marine uh, you know, professional stories. Um, yeah. We were specifically asking about. So you talk about the Morgan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your sailboats, like, what sort of projects have you personally dived into? Have you installed, I don't know, a cooler, a shower, uh, you know, redone something, repainted? Like, how, how deep have you gone in? Um, I boat, it's, um, it's really a matter of restoration because at this point, most of the systems work as they should, but, uh, it's a matter of restoration. The refrigeration works perfectly. The, um, the engine works as it should. But the the plumbing system, I started with that. I would say to use the uh, the PEX fitting, the but not the shark style, the the alternate style, because that's in my opinion the best. It doesn't leak. But yeah, I mean it's it's really about what you want with your boat, how clean you want it. I just basically replace system by system. You know, if I if I find a product that's you know a better product, then I'll install that. And have you, you know, built a little bit. electrical projects yet? Electrical, yeah, that's, uh, that's the next big endeavor. I would like to replace most of the, the panels with digital readouts and stuff like that, but most of it's simple and it, it won't shock you. It's 12 volt, you know, hmm. so. Yeah. And say somebody else was getting a boat, you know, similar to yours, like what sort of, you know, two, three, five things could you, you know, just say you need to almost learn basically on the job, right? Be aware of that. Well, uh, electrical is definitely one of them. Basic skills for sure. Troubleshooting, troubleshooting engines, basic maintenance on engines, mm. specific so to the diesel that's, that's in your boat. Yeah, because you, you're an engine right. guy. Right. No, none of it's easy. None of it's yeah. easy, but these right. are easily, I mean, it, it's, it's probably a few steps that you need to learn and you need to buy the right tools. Um, mm, I think that's an important one, right? Have the right tools on yeah. hand. Otherwise you could just be sitting there looking at it for days. Yeah. And of course, just like a house, you can always pay somebody to do all these things. Mm. Um, however, when you're at sea, if you do stay a lot and you don't just, you aren't just a liveaboard, then you'll have to learn this if something does go wrong. Mm. But that's part of the adventure. Mm. That's true as well. That's a good point. So I think two, two great points Rob just mentioned that one was have the right tool handy. And then two is ideally be able to do it yourself. You could just hire somebody, but if you ever had to do it yourself, you should know how to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. You need to learn the basic skills. You, the more you know about your boat, the better you'll be. You know, yes. if you smell something, you know, the more time you spend on your boat, the the more you'll know about it because you'll you'll recognize when something's off. And it's it's really just the same as uh, as a house, for instance, because uh, you know, going to your house, you smell something. You, oh, I forgot this. I did this, or that's burnt up. You know, mm-hmm. oh, the air is not turning on. You know. But I I've think never it's, had uh, uh, any of those problems with the home. <laughs> <laughs> the home sinking, right? Yikes. Well, that's true. Now that's true. But that, yeah, actually, that would be one of the uh, the uh, downsides is that your home can sink. You can move it, but you could sink it, <laughs> right? So be careful. And I think, and and for liveaboards, that's what makes the whole thing very real for them is that they're like I am currently moving with all my belongings <laughs> yeah it would not be a fun day if something happened so that's no. not how it happened no um, and again that's why you need to basically learn uh, your your boat goes without saying and and so are you actually Meryl you do this one take it into the teaching and maybe more safety type stuff so um, do you ever take friends out or People that know nothing about boats, or you generally just hang out with people at the marina. No, I take uh, I take friends out that yeah know nothing about boats. Sometimes it's the first time they've been on boats. Uh, so when you mean friends, is it like friends in quotations, like you know the <laughs> ones that you find on dating apps? No, no, none of that. <laughs> no, these are um, <laughs> no, these are uh, these are people that I know, like maybe through work. Or you know, personal friends. And and so how does that go down when when somebody has no experience? Is it almost the same thing as you just solo handling it, or do you trust them a little? Or yeah. How does it play out? Yes. I mean, what you'll do is you'll you know you'll once we, you get underway, you'll you'll give them some basic tasks to 
get them comfortable with operating the boat with you and then uh, see how they handle that and go from there. You know, but always I would say like if the person is not comfortable on a boat, make sure you have life jackets handy and uh, as many as you need. Just in case they uh, jump overboard to their death, huh? <laughs> We're going right. to sailboat, so it's not going too fast. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so, but at night, at night, that is true. Risky, right? If somebody falls off, you might not even see them. So, but okay, alcohol. So, yeah, without without getting too crazy, tell us about like some of the weirdest experiences you've had on the water, and they could be whatever you want. Yeah, keep it a little PG, maybe. But like maybe it's sea life. You yeah, know, like maybe it was an adventure. Sure. Like some of the coolest things you've seen. Maybe it was people oh. drinking too much. Mm. Making asses on themselves. Who knows? What was it? Well, going through storms on the sea is absolutely magical to me. Seeing the sun come through right before and then afterwards. And when you're in it, it's not typically not what you would imagine. It's, um, for me anyways, I'm all struck by it. And, um, and of course, the wildlife out there is unbelievable certain times of year. I've seen birds fishing that look like clouds on the horizon, like just whole, you know, National Geographic style, all of them diving in the water at the same time. So you never know what you're going to see out there, and every single time is, a, is uh, something pretty uh, amazing usually. It's not always amazing, especially at uh, certain times of year, but you can yeah. go out during those times. And and I think near the Bay Area where we are right now, like it's, it's not just like normal wildlife because we're so close to like, the, the bases and stuff, we'll see, you know, their cool boats. So, like, I remember over here we saw, oh, like, like, four hovercraft, you know, leave the base at the same time. And I'm like, what is that? Yeah. I mean, that was the well, first time I was seeing You know, yeah. I, and Tala, you know, that's that's what I do for a living now. Mm. I'm mm. Uh, yeah. one of those people out there going crazy with the military boat, you know. Yeah, that's Rob's new so, uh Yeah, ex- explain what exactly you do these days. So I work for uh, what's called ATMO, ATMO, Atlantic Target and Marine Operations. We we go out and we re- we're basically pirates against the United States. Um, we have go fast boats, we have cigarette boats, they're basically the same thing. But the other boats we have, roughly around 50 knots, and um, we'll stalk a, a ship coming through a strait, like for instance the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and we'll go out and attack them, have mock <laughs> weapons and. And, uh, yeah, just shot at. <laughs> the ship will be running at 30 plus knots and we'll be in their wake. And we have wave runners as well. We go out with wave runners in the summer and attack. We also have three ships that are retired Navy ocean tugs that we go down to Florida and off the coast of South Carolina and attack the fleet in the open ocean and ocean waves and stuff. Mm. So that's what I'm doing now. And then, of course, when we're back here in Norfolk, we're just maintaining the fleet. Sounds fun. So, Sounds like, is, is it your dream job? Is, is this sort of stuff? You wanted to get into? Saw yourself getting into? Well, it's, um, sure. Sure, you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not a job you ever thought you would have, though. It's not being like a, a typical job, for sure. Uh, yeah, being a target, exactly. But in reality, <laughs> these ships, yeah, we'll, leave that, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> so you've obviously, in, in your adventures on the water, you know, over the you know, last few decades, you've met, you know, lots and lots of different people. Like, tell us about some of the most interesting people you've met. Now, now it's all you asked me a pretty loaded question there. Well, uh, <laughs> Dude. Maybe, maybe your interpersonal demons, met those, or anything like that. Everything I've, everything I've learned has been on or around ships or the water. I mean, in my adult life. I mean, that's, that's for sure. That, that goes without saying. And then beforehand, my fascination with everything. And so, yeah, naturally it's led me into a, a maritime industry and then, of course, with me finally living on my own sailboat here. But, um, yeah, like the, whole, you, the whole, uh, the whole, whole experience. Was the community one of the amazing. reasons you're here? You stayed? Like, was that it? Absolutely. Uh, especially where we're at here in Virginia. The community here at this marina is, is, is great. Um, it's probably better in some places than others. You know, you have to pick and choose. Describe like, it, though. Like, if you know. somebody doesn't live on the water, like, what are they missing out on? Everything. Every, yeah, yeah, I would agree with you there, Meryl. Everything. I mean, you're, and I'm sure, you know, living in a house for some people never gets old, but waking up in the same place for 30, 40 years to me just sounds not fun. You gotta, I just want to be able to move it. I want to be able to enjoy it. I don't know if you're into the, the water life, then that's, that's really the way to go. What about RV to boat? 
I mean, what would what's the difference? That's there? an interesting perspective. Yeah, I've been interested in that just because of the freedom of that. But the upfront costs are pretty high, and then of course operating that vehicle. It depends, on, I guess, on how long you would stay in a place. You know, if you stayed in in a certain location for a while and moved along, but just to, you know, if you're trying to live minimalist, uh, and uh, yeah, it could it could add up real quick being on the road. Plus, you're restricted, you know, in where you can actually go. So, bringing you back to boats for a sec, how again, like maybe this could be like top three tips or something that you could give to people on you know, how to actually survive living on a boat and enjoying it at the end of it. Well, pay attention to everything, all the advice you get, and follow through with it, and uh, make sure you buy the right boat. <laughs> Do your research on, uh, you know, what what is best all around for everything. It's it's going to be what you want at the end of the day, you know. Mm. But pick the smartest choice. Yeah, well, mm. when I describe living on a boat, and people ask me, you know, how did you get into it? I say, okay, so you want to hear my fall from grace? Right. Um, Rob, you mentioned that you really are awestruck by storms. What are some of like the craziest storms you've been in? And were you docked or were you out at sea while they were going on? Uh, both, both. Both. I uh, I was on a hurricane at one point, and it. I just expected more. It was it was 70 mile an hour winds, but uh, it, the boats were fine. You just you have to make sure they're tied up right, and and uh, just have everything ready to go. You don't, mm-hmm. you know, that's just come part of the territory. And and but which you uh, wouldn't leave. Vessel was this? What's that? Which vessel were you on at, the, at this point? I was on Morgan. On the Morgan. Okay. So that yeah. was recent. And like, what's some of the craziest storms you saw on like? The bigger boats you've been on? Oh boy, um, 50 foot in the North Atlantic was probably the biggest I've seen. It was, uh, it appeared to be even with the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. <laughs> wow. And could, like, you feel it on the aircraft carrier or was it just like dominating anyway? No, you felt it. You felt it. Mm. It, uh, it would dig in and, uh, the whole ship would shake and shudder and, yeah, you knew, you knew what was going on outside. Yeah. And this is a thousand foot boat. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we've talked a lot about boats. Uh, actually, Mel, maybe you jump into this 24 dream boat type. So uh, if you won the lottery, would you get a bigger boat? Would you get a custom boat? What would you do? I would buy a bigger um, mint condition 80s boat, probably a Hinkley. It would probably be a Hinkley 40 Bermuda. And would this help you on your whole Mediterranean dream plan, dream adventure? Yeah. Come on. Okay. Just a yeah. Hinkley, just a 40-foot Hinkley. Come on. Yeah. This man wants a solo. Probably bigger than that. Well, the solo aspect to me is good. And then the boat, the way it cuts through the water, it's unbelievable. It's, um, I mean, no wind. You'll be going nine knots. Like, I'm sure you could get a much faster, more modern boat. But as far as strength, it's just not there in the newer boat. And because the fiberglass is just made thinner. Not thinner and the, the keels are, are truly just, you know, well, they're bolted on and there, there's nothing there really. Some of the boats have gotten better with, with like modular aluminum framing that everything on the boat connects to. But that's just my opinion. I, I, I wouldn't say that they're bad. I just, I wouldn't classify them as blue water boats. They need to have a, you know, a, a real keel and they need to have a, uh, keel set mast mm-hmm. to be a blue water boat in my opinion. Okay. And, so we know what would make a good boat. What other sort of gear should somebody keep in mind if they have dreams like yours? Safety. Safety Bring gear. Down what does that mean? Uh, you need to have the uh, EPIRB, your locating system. If you go offshore, you need to have, uh, certainly need to have plenty of, uh, how would I describe this? You need to have devices that can signal to shore. You need to have a good radio satellite if you're going offshore. Uh, you need to have a life raft if you're going offshore. That's and certified. A life raft, as Alaska has pointed out, is not a dinghy. No, it is not. Yeah. Exactly. And um, you just need to make sure your systems work the way they should. Uh, and you have no question about them working the way they should. And um, as they say, it needs to be ship shape. You need to make sure that nothing will fail when it shouldn't fail. Mm. I like the little plug oh, there, Robbie. Like, Thank you. What's that? <laughs> I like the you're little ship shape plug there, yeah. Yeah. If you could go back and do it all over again, you know, even before getting the S2, what would you have done differently? Nothing. You would have got the S2 again? <laughs> that boat taught me a lot about what not to look, what to avoid in a mm-hmm. boat. 
True. Like, you no, know, you know, it really did. And it was a short-lived experience, but, you know, again, I wouldn't change it just because of what it taught me. So the age-old question is, is it cheaper to live on a boat? What do you find, Mike? Yeah, in every single way. It doesn't matter if you're on a, a more expensive boat or an older, cheaper boat. It's always going to be cheaper. Well, I guess it is pretty cheap when you're living at cheap marinas. That's right. Mm. That's right. You have to find the right marina as well. And but so Rob, break it down some more for us. Like when you say it's going to be cheaper in every way, like what do you do for like water and electric and you know people always ask the first thing like where does all the waste go or what do you do about that? So what what are some of those basic things and how do you do them? Well, your waste goes into a what is called a holding tank and that is usually the lowest point of the uh, whole conversation here. It's really not as bad as one would think. You simply have it pumped out, and the marina typically will take care of that. The the electric, it comes from the short power on the pier. It's a 30-amp service. Uh, it really, once the power comes to your boat, it operates uh, typically the same as, as your house. You know, I mean, you, you use it as you need to use it. It's not too much thought given, uh, yeah. especially on short power. Well, if you got a 30 amp and you got a microwave and you got a heater going, you're going to trip the 30 amp. That's right. Yep. That's the sort of stuff you get used to fast, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You would get used to that fast. Again, there is changes in your lifestyle typically, but you adjust to them. What about the water? What do you do for water? Water is in a holding tank. It goes through filters and it's, it's operated by a, a pump, but, um, you, you do have to refill the water tanks once every two weeks on my boat, for instance. That's the only downside to it. But so that would be the sort of limiting factor then in how long you could stay out as well, sort of, as well. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. That would be the limiting factor. So on the aircraft carrier, what would you have to plug in in order to trip the nuclear? The <laughs> <laughs> whole thing shuts down. Uh, <laughs> two, micro- two microwaves, a heater. What, what was it? No, that, uh, so in like 19, like 30 something, there was a, a aircraft carrier and this was not nuclear. This was just an old steam driven, uh, oil fired and it powered the city of Portland for like three months. And that was in the 1930s. What? It just plugged right so, in. Yeah. Sure. I power. guess they had some sort of conversion on shore. Yeah. Oh, but, wow. uh, I can't imagine what a new one would do. It'd probably yeah. power a, a medium city. Pretty crazy. So we're close, almost close to the end, Rob. So why don't, like on our way out, why don't we perhaps like ask you to share with our listeners some of the apps or, or websites, you know, that you think really helped you on your boating journey. And uh, maybe and then we can just do a recap and, you know, give them a top five that, you know, can get them on their adventure. I typically go, I, I don't look at too many sites for like uh, how to live on a boat. For instance, I don't have any of that sort of thing going on, but I, I do look at sites for, for um, different parts and 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 ordering stuff uh, for the boat. Uh, West Marine is obviously a big one. Defender Marine. You have uh, Ship Shape. <laughs> and what do you do for weather? Dakwa. Also, uh, Windy. Windy is a good one for checking the weather. And um, also Navionics. Navionics is something I use a lot to help deal with uh, navigation. And and I'll just like pre-plan trips on the computer and then, you know, do it that way. It's a lot easier. And then you can plot that into your your, uh, GPS router. That's something that's uh, that's probably my top app that I use, I would say, while living on the boat. So Mm -hmm. what are the top five tips of living on a boat from your experience? Top five tips? Besides just do it. (laughs) Yes. Pick where you want to, you know, you want to live on your boat carefully. Again, you were talking about marina costs. That's definitely something you want to pay attention to. But also pay attention to how the marinas ran because you want to enjoy your uh, your stay while you're there. You know, if you mm-hmm. pick a place that just doesn't have good amenities, the service is poor, then so is your experience going to be poor. Pick a boat that you're going to enjoy because you're going to be living on this boat. You want it to be comfortable. You want to be able to mold it to the way you want. Is it too far gone? Stuff like this. Just make sure you, it has the right amenities on board as well for your comfort. You don't want to skip out on amenities with the boat. It's better to have them pre-installed and uh, not have to worry about installing them. And um, always pay attention to the weather. And uh, 
listen and listen to all the advice you can get and that would be my advice to you well and then most I, of it will come naturally i can definitely tell through this whole conversation that you've been on a boat way too long yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah for rob is just second yeah. nature guys i'm sorry <laughs> i'm uh you can edit yeah. this out but i'm just yeah yeah we, we play that but so final goodbyes left so rob so thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your experiences and your knowledge with our listeners and uh i really hope it it helps other people get out on the water and you know live their dreams and you know maybe sail the world the way you want to sail it so thank you so much for being here and being a part of this and best of luck to you welcome thank you If you like this content, you love what we have on shipshape.pro. 